Today we'll be continuing the discussion of regularization and talk about a different type of regularization. So last time we talked about regularization, which was this idea of putting a complexity penalty into our loss. And we talked about a particular type of regularization, which is L2 regularization, meaning that we added the 2 norm of the weight vector to the loss. And today we'll do a bunch of things, but the main thing we want to talk about today is what are the implications if we change that to a 1 norm. And when we talked about robust losses for regression, we discovered there are actually some pretty serious impl implications if I change the loss from a squared error to absolute value error. It actually did something quite different. It had some interesting properties. So we'll see again today that just changing a norm actually has pretty serious implications. Um, so lambda we talked about is this coefficient that measures the strength of the regularization. If I set lambda to 0, that just makes the regularization go away. If I set lambda towards infinity, it just pushes all the weights to 0, and you begin to ignore the data. And linear regression with L2 regularization is called ridge regression. So if you've heard that term, it's just the word for this. And we briefly mentioned at the end of last class that in terms of solving the system, we don't really need to do any extra work when we add L2 regularization. Uh, that's not going to be true anymore today. So it just seems like an all around good thing that is most of the time a good idea. And you can pick lambda just as you would pick any other hyperparameter. OK, so we're going to talk for a minute about this issue of scaling, which came up a bit on Wednesday. And we've talked about it probably a couple of times here and there in the course, which is what if our different features have different scales? So the eggs and pasta features here seem to be around 1, and the amounts of fish and milk seem to be in the hundreds. And we've mentioned a few times that some of our methods, especially the distance-based ones, are sensitive to these scales. And um, we don't want those big features to dominate for no reason, because we might care about all of our features equally, and we just happen to use these particular units. So with decision trees, well, with naive Bayes, we actually just talked about discrete features in any case. But with decision trees, it doesn't matter because we get to pick the thresholds to be whatever I want. So if I double or multiply by 1,000 my units, my threshold is just going to be correspondingly bigger. But everything's going to be the same. Um, and we also talked about how for regular or ordinary least squares linear regression, Again, it doesn't matter because each feature gets its own W. If I scale the feature, I can just correspondingly scale the W. OK, so we talked about this. It matters for K and N. Uh, and then I think we just talked about this at the tail end on Wednesday, which is that once you add regularization to linear regression, then the scaling actually matters. So since you're just adding the w squared to your objective, if I have something that's really big, then w squared will be really big. And if I try to change w a little bit there, the, the amount of penalty that corresponds to that change will be different than if w is scaled down. So um, you can try a little example if, if you don't believe it. We're not going to go through one now. But it sort of makes sense, because instead of each w just talking 
to its own feature, we're actually adding something up to do with all the W's. So they're kind of being put on equal footing, and that doesn't quite seem right if they're at very different scales. So what can we do about this? Um, we can do something called standardizing the features, which is a pre-processing step before we start whatever we're going to do. And for each feature, you can compute the sample mean of that feature, meaning the average value of all the data you collected. Um, and you can also compute the standard deviation, which is, as we talked about, a measure of the spread. So the milk uh, amounts are going to have much bigger standard deviation because they're spread wider. It's sort of like the units of the feature. Um, and then we can do the standardization step, which says, first shift the thing so that its average is 0. So that's the centering. And then divide by sigma, that's the scaling. And then when you're, when you're done with that, all your features should have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation or variance of 1. So all your features, they, their distributions might not look exactly the same. If you made a histogram, that's fine. But they should all be roughly at the same scale. And there's some things to think about here in terms of what are outliers going to do, et cetera. But um, roughly, this is going to solve the, the simple versions of our feature scaling problems. Um, and one, one complication that comes up is we've been sort of going back and forth between thinking of the intercept in linear regression as its own special thing with its own special name versus let's just add a column of ones and make it its own w. But now we want to be a little bit careful here um, because say we're not, say, OK, the intercept represents basically the overall shifting, say, 1D linear regression. We have a line. Or in more dimensions, we have this plane or, or surface. The intercept term is just sort of where is the thing centered at, roughly. Um, and regularization that we talked about last time was all about the complexity of the model. And we tried to talk about bigger Ws, meaning more complexity. But it doesn't really seem like a bigger intercept it seems like more complexity. It's just where the thing is, right? If it's over here or it's over there. Whatever. So um, you could make arguments about how you should deal with the intercept in terms of regularization. Um, uh, this is an argument that I would support. But um, we talked, to, not in detail, but we talked a little bit about how regularization made some of the computation aspects a little more appealing. Uh, we didn't go into it too much, but in terms of making the matrix invertible, and all that kind of stuff. The matrix, I mean x transpose x, the matrix in the normal equations. Um, and so I, I think you, you could add a little bit of regularization and still reap some of those computational benefits. But kind of philosophically, I think the answer is no. That, that doesn't really make sense to regularize the intercept if it's just telling me where the data lies. And why is this on the same slide as talking about standardization? It's on the same slide as talking about standardization because this slide here is talking about the standardization of x, our features. But we can also talk about standardization of y, our target values, which is kind of stepping on the toes of the intercept. I mean, they're sort of doing the same job, in a sense, that the intercept allows you to shift your regression surface up and down depending on these y values, basically. Um, but you can also standardize your y values by doing the same thing we just talked about, 
subtracting the mean and possibly scaling, possibly not scaling. And it's not always the same as having an intercept, but it's the same roughly thing that you're accomplishing. I mean, forget about the scaling for a minute, just in terms of shifting the y values by the mean. The intercept could learn to accomplish that. The intercept could turn out to be exactly the mean, and then it's basically the same thing, but the intercept could be something else that's, I don't know, close to the mean. So, it kind of relates to regularization in the sense that if you want to think about it this way, instead of thinking about it in terms of the intercept, in case it paints a clearer picture for you, uh, if you standardize y, so first of all, all these preprocessing steps, you have to be very careful how you deal with your test data. So um, when you standardize your features, you have some mean of your, of your features. You need to store those means and perform the same standardization on your test data because whatever weird stuff you do to your training data before you put it into your model, your model is expecting data of that form. So you need to do that same stuff to your test data. Um, and in terms of the outputs, if I subtract 10 from all my values, then later when I make a prediction, I should add 10 back on to get it into the original units that I had. Um, so if I subtract off the mean, then predicting 0 basically means predicting the average value. And so if that helps you think about regularization, you can think about it that way, that I'm pushing all the W values towards 0. And that's what we had at the very beginning, last class, the beginning of that Jupyter Notebook. I was trying to make that appeal um, to, your, to your intuition that, OK, let's start by just predicting the mean, and then let's use a, a feature, and then maybe not use it all that much. So um, this stuff might seem a little mundane, but standardizing, normalizing, it's so important. Um, and it even happened to me maybe a month ago that a student came to talk to me. He had been working on something, couldn't get it to work. We looked at it for a while. Turned out it was something that needed to be standardized or normalized, and otherwise nothing functioned properly. Um, and then everything was, was just fine. So. This is maybe not that exciting, but it's very important, so don't, don't forget about it. Anna? Um, yeah, I guess I was wondering, why are we pushing W towards 0 and not 1? If like, multiplying by 1,000 is bad, wouldn't dividing by 1,000 be bad as well? Why are we pushing W, I see, towards 0 and not to 1? OK. Um, imagine we've already standardized um, the, the targets and we don't have an intercept. If all my w's are 0, remember my prediction is w dot product with x and then plus an intercept if I have it. So if all my w's are 0, it's saying I'm taking all my features and multiplying them by 0 and then adding that up, which is still 0. So if w's are 0, then it's like I, my prediction just ignores the features and I end up just predicting the intercept or just predicting the average value. W, so 0 is the special value. Um, 1 just says I add up all my values of my features, like I dot product x with the 1 vector. There's nothing special about that, I guess. That's just a line with a slope of 1. And, and, if, and if the weights are 0, then? If, the, if all the weights are actually 0, then you're predicting the same thing no matter what x is, because x is just being ignored. It's just being multiplied by 0. So that's this horizontal line in one dimension or a horizontal plane. or uh, it, it just means you're always predicting the same thing. And that's kind of the least complex model you could have. It's just I'm going to predict 5 every time, not even look at the features. And the w could be more than 1, less than 1. It could be positive, negative. 
So I, the positive and negative has a certain meaning, but more than one, less than one doesn't really have a special interpretation. There was a question. Yeah, what's your? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Gurinder? Yeah. Gurinder? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm having a bit of trouble thinking of a scenario when you want to standardize the target value. Um, Gurinder's question was, when do you want to standardize the target value? So it sort of depends what you're doing. Um, I think in everything we've talked about so far, it probably doesn't matter, um, except insofar as it might be useful to think about it that way if it helps you think about regularization. Because any shifting that you do of y could just be built into the intercept. Um, I should be a little bit careful. I mean, if you really are regularizing the intercept for whatever reason, then maybe you could get a slightly different answer if you shifted your data. Also, in terms of the scaling, I, I strongly suspect that um, this wouldn't matter for the methods we've talked about so far. And, and when that comes up, I will flag it in, in the future. But now I'm thinking about it a little more as we go. OK. Um, I got derailed thinking about this question. OK, if I think about something more, then I'll answer it later. So there's other transformations you can do other than just shifting and scaling. So you can also, common things to do, and I think I talked about this before, is um, log or x for, especially if you have something that's in a certain range and you think it, sh it should be in some other range, like then, then you, you, there's a whole bunch of transformations that have different domain specific uses, but they can be quite important. And these transformations down here are nonlinear, right? So if you're using linear regression, but the actual trend is not linear, then you're not going to get a good fit. But if you already know sort of what the shape is, you could undo that shape by transforming and then use linear regression. OK. So that was that. Um, just going back to RBFs, these uh, non-parametric features that we talked about before. Um, we talked about regularization, which has this hyperparameter lambda. And we also talked about this other hyperparameter sigma last time, which is the width of the bump in RBFs. And so we talked briefly as well about the fact that you can pick these two hyperparameters with the validation set or cross-validation. And that should hopefully do a pretty good job of avoiding overfitting, because it'll pick lambda and sigma bigger if there's too much overfitting. So this is just to say that adding up some things that we've talked to in the last few days, combining them, you can get to a pretty nice model that may do a good job in a lot of, in a lot of circumstances, other than the fact that predictions might still be pretty slow because of this non-parametricness, so that you have to compute all these distances with your training data even to make predictions. OK, so this is just saying stuff we've already talked about, combine them, you can get something good out of it. Uh, but it raises this question of, well, how do we pick these hyperparameters sigma and lambda? And I think I mentioned last time already as well that this may be the first time we've actually had two hyperparameters we had to pick. And I'll just say a couple of minutes worth about this broader topic of hyperparameter optimization, which is this pretty pesky part of 
the machine learning pipeline because it can be hard to optimize these hyperparameters. So again, the reason why this is hard is I want to try out a whole bunch of different sigma lambda combinations. And each time I pick one, like sigma equals 5, lambda equals 2, just to try out that one hyperparameter set, I have to run the whole training and validation procedure, which could take a very long time if I had a big data set. So it's a loop within a loop or an optimization within an optimization, right? Because the inner loop is the training of your model, which is maybe gradient descent. And then this outer loop is this search over different hyperparameters, but search optimization, it, it really, it's really optimization, right? You can just call it search, but it's the same thing. So um, some approaches that come to mind are try a grid of value. So I'm going to try lambda equals, I don't know, 1, 2, 3, or maybe more likely 1, 10, 100, and sigma, I don't know, 1, 10, 100. And then I'll take the product of those two spaces. So I have three sigmas I want to try out, three lambdas I want to try out. So that's nine possibilities. I'll just try all of them. Maybe nine isn't so bad. Maybe you want to do 10 of each. Now that's 100. That's not that great, but maybe still doable. Not so doable if you have 20 hyperparameters and 20 choices of each, and then it's 20 to the power of 20, which is not going to happen. Uh, another popular search is, another popular choice is random search. So just randomly pick uh, sigma lambda combinations and do however many you want and then take the best one. So in Python, scikit-learn offers some functions that package this all up for you in cross-validation. So you've already seen from the assignment, assuming you've worked on it, that at the end you have to implement cross-validation. And it's, there's a lot of loops to keep going on in your head, right? There's, you're looping over the hyperparameter. And then within that, you're looping over the k cross-validation sets. And then within that, you're training the model, which goes into a gradient descent loop. So now we're at three loops to keep track of. So scikit-learn provides these uh, methods that just run the whole thing for you. So you tell it what the hyperparameters are, and it just does the cross-validation for you, makes the grid for you, and it's kind of convenient. Um, so this is just, just for fun, but there's a whole whole bunch more advanced hyperparameter optimization um, methods out there. So you could for optimize one hyperparameter at a time. Well, that's, that's actually not more advanced. That's less advanced um, and not too great because the hyperparameters can interact with each other. So if I pick sigma equals 1 and find the best lambda, and then later decide sigma should be 10, my lambda might not be the best lambda anymore. Um, so you can treat this as just a general op global optimization problem, but it's very different from the optimization that we've been dealing with. Uh, for example, you probably don't have the gradient of your cross-validation error with respect to lambda, right? That's uh, a hard thing to think about. So you're actually operating in this derivative-free setting, which makes optimization much harder because you're kind of blind. You don't know which direction to go in. Um, and th there's no reason, it may, may not be convex, there may be all kinds of local minima, so it's pretty, it's pretty messy stuff. Um, I'll just make a pitch for Bayesian optimization since it's something I've worked on. This is adding like another loop of machine learning on top of all the loops we've already talked about, which is treat your hyperparameter landscape as a regression problem. So I've tried out 10 hyperparameter sets. I got the cross-validation error in every case, or the validation error. Now I'm going to treat that as just a data set and try to do reg regression and try to predict how good I would be at, at any point in the hyperparameter space, even though I have very limited data. So you have to be 
very careful with what type of regression you do and then given that try to intelligently pick the next hyperparameters to try based on that fancy regression that you just did. How well does that work? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Fed asked how well does it work. So um, it works pretty well except it's very slow so it can sometimes take minutes to even decide what hyperparameters to try next. Uh, which is very bad if it only takes 30 seconds for you to run one loop, right? So, but if it takes you 12 hours to train your model on some giant data set, then it's more worth putting in the effort. But um, at least the particular flavor that I worked on, there's all kinds of issues. Like it works, it's much better suited to continuous hyperparameters than discrete and all kinds of things. Okay, that was some kind of miscellaneous stuff and now we can get to L1 regularization unless there's any questions or comments. The brain is supposed to be very parallel, but it turns out I can't teach and think about Gurinder's question at the same time, which is unfortunate. So I'm only teaching. Um, oh well. Okay. So before we talked about feature selection and we talked about search and score, um, which was this idea of I have some score of how good a set of features are. Great, now let me just search for the best set of features. But oh wait, there are two to the D such sets. That's very scary. And then we had this greedy forward selection algorithm as one of several ways out of that mess. <coughs> we talked about this L0 norm stuff, which is specifically for linear regression. Remember, you might want to do feature selection and all kinds of problems. We're just focusing on linear regression right now. But when we're focusing on linear regression, we have this convenient way of this convenient correspondence between throwing away a feature and setting the w to 0 that allows us to write it in this nice L0 norm notation. And saying that it's hard to solve the feature selection problem was like saying it's hard to solve this optimization problem because they're actually the same problem. Okay, um, so we talked about forward selection, which even though it was an approximation, was still kind of slow in the sense that just to select the first feature, we had to try every possible feature as a candidate for being the first feature. So that's D models just to pick the first feature, D models with one feature in them. And then once we picked the first feature, then we had to try every possible remaining feature to be the second feature and so on. And so you get this d squared like behavior. Um, and so today we're going to try something else which is this. Okay, so this looks much like our friend from Wednesday L2 regularization. It's called L1 regularization. We have just changed the little 2 to a little 1. Well, we actually had a 2 norm squared before, and now we just have the absolute value. OK, so this has some properties that are kind of like L2 regularization. We the optimization problem is convex. It deals with the overfitting thing because it penalizes large values of W. Not as harshly, but it still penalizes large values of W. But this second line is the one takeaway message of the whole lecture today. Unlike L2 regularization, L1 regularization encourages elements of W 
to be not just small, but exactly zero. There's a question up there? You got it? Yeah. OK. And I'm not talking about like I looked at my, you know, exactly zero because I'm rounding to zero or something. I'm talking about like mathematically, pen and paper, no computers. I wrote down the solution to the optimization problem, and a bunch of the Ws were exactly zero. That was the solution. Yeah, well, what's your name? Vanessa. Vanessa. Uh, so are you saying that the whole uh, function is convex, or just the L1 norm is convex? Um, the question is, am I saying the whole function is convex, or just the L1 norm? So both are, and I'm, both pieces are, and I'm adding them together, and therefore the whole thing is. But if it's an absolute value, how is it convex? If it's an absolute value, how is it convex? So it is not smooth, but it is convex. So okay. it satisfies our test of I draw a line between two points on the curve, and the line is above the curve. Okay. Um, but you're right that it's not smooth. And I guess you could say it's not, um, it is barely convex, but it is. Uh, and we can talk about the smoothness later. OK, so if what I said is true, you should be interested. Because I presented feature selection to you as a, well, horrifically messy but also useful and important question. And then I only gave you some <laughs> approximate and slow and not that bad, but not maybe always the best way of solving the feature selection problem. And here I'm coming to you with this other idea, in this case for linear regression, but we can extend this to other models beyond linear regression, as let's not do this stage-wise um, adding this feature, then adding that feature. We can just write down one optimization problem and actually solve it, because we already decided we're good at solving convex optimization problems. And that's kind of cool. And it sets a bunch of them to exactly zero, which means it decides to throw away those features. So when you're done, not only can you make predictions, but if you're curious, you can go look at W and say which ones are zero. In other words, say which features did you decide to throw away and which ones did you decide to keep or select. OK, so this is nice. Um, it's also called lasso. So uh, linear regression plus L2, it's called ridge, plus L1 regularization, called lasso. These are just extra words we have to be aware of. OK, I'm going to try to argue. The main thing we need to do today, really, is for me to try to give you at least some intuition of why this exactly zero thing is happening. That's really my goal for the next. Uh, 16 minutes, not 26 minutes. Um, so good old 1D least squares, no regularization. We've looked at these types of plots before. W on the x-axis, the loss on the y-axis. And based on the data set, the minimum is going to be in some place. And that thing's going to look like a parabola, because if you look at that, it's a quadratic function of w. It's a bunch of stuff with w squared, so it's going to be some sort of parabola pointing up. And in this case, say the minimum happens to be pretty close to 0, like 0 0.01. And so you kind of have a feeling that this variable could be thrown away, and yet it didn't get thrown away with L2 regularization. It just got a very low weight. And sometimes that might be fine. But sometimes you might actually want to do feature selection to know which features were selected and not. And we did talk before about, well, I can just check when the weights were small. Um, but there are some issues with, with doing that. <coughs> 
OK. So now we say, OK, let's add L0 regularization, like we talked about on Monday. So we can think of the two terms in the loss as two pictures that are then being added together to produce the third picture. The picture on the left is just the thing from the previous slide, the unregularized loss with respect to W. And the new term, the L0 term, can be drawn like this thing in the middle. It says, if I'm 0, then the norm is 0. Remember, W is just one element here in this toy example. It's not a vector. And if I'm anything other than 0, I have to pay a penalty of lambda. That's what L0 does. And then I can add those two things together and get the overall f of w, which is the picture on the right. And the regularization basically shifts everything up, which you don't really care about, except at the one zero point, it pulls it way down. So if before the minimum was clear near zero, the new minimum is now going to be at exactly zero, and that's why L0 regularization works. But if the original minimum was very far from zero, then if the parabola was over here and was already quite high above zero, even dropping it a little bit wouldn't have been enough to throw it away. So this is a kind of important for going forward. So any questions about, specifically questions about how the pictures relate to the equations? So we've said all this stuff. Um, if the thing was close to being thrown away, it now gets thrown away. It's non-convex. That causes us problems optimizing it. Um, so here's the picture with L2 regularization. The penalty, the regularization, which is drawn in the middle, is itself a parabola, but a parabola that's centered at 0, whereas the last parabola is centered at whatever the best value would have been for W had I not used regularization. But when you add two parabolas, you just get another parabola. And when you add two parabolas, I guess, I don't know exactly under what conditions, but at least in this case in 1D where they're both pointing upwards, the minimum of the new parabola is going to be somewhere between the minima, if I, I should practice what I preach. The minimizer of the new parabola will be somewhere between the minimizers of the other two curves. So in other words, regularization is just going to shift the, the minimizer a little bit towards 0, but it's never going to make it exactly 0. So L2 regularization, in other words, pushes the w a little bit towards 0. And the bigger lambda is, the harder the push. But it will never get to exactly 0. OK, here's the big moment. Um, when you use an absolute value regularization, if the original w was going to be kind of near 0, if it was going to be very far from 0, it's not going to get thrown away. That's exactly how you decide if a feature is selected or not. If it would have been near 0, it gets put at exactly 0. Um, so when you add these two things together, and in the bonus slides, there's a whole lot of slides detailing examples with derivations of why it happens from a mathematical point of view. But let me tell you the intuitive point of view. The intuitive point of view is that L2 regularization is a parabola, meaning its slope goes to 0 as you cl get close to 0. So my desire to go to 0 actually diminishes when I get very near it. Because if I'm at 0 0.001, my penalty is already very tiny. It's 0 0.001 squared. And the slope, the amount of extra happiness I would get by going all the way to 0. It's just a very, the slope itself approaches 0, so I never get there. But with the absolute value, because it's sharp, 
the slope stays constant all the way to zero and so there's always a pretty decent incentive to keep moving. The incentive to get to zero doesn't diminish as I approach zero, it just stays steady and that's the intuitive version of why you get things that are exactly zero. Okay, so lambda controls the strength of regularization just like before, which also means if I pick lambda to be really big, I'm going to throw away more features than if I pick lambda to be small. So it's kind of like this nice slider of how strong feature selection do I want to do, um, just like the lambda was for L0. So we looked at this regularization path before for L2, which is we had lambda on the x-axis and then we had all the weights and we got to see as we made lambda bigger all the weights were approaching zero. And we can make the same plot for L1. And what you can see here is some of the weights are kind of snapping to zero at a certain point and then they just stay zero after that. So instead of all of them kind of asymptotically approaching zero as lambda gets bigger, some of the weights are snapping to zero and they're just shutting off that feature. And the bigger you make lambda, the more these features get shut off. Fred woke up. The regularization path was exciting enough. <laughs> Any questions or comments on this? This is again one of those things that you may take a while to digest and it may be worth looking through the bonus slides and I've only given you the sort of intuitive answer. Um, yeah, Fed. So for this particular model, the sexiest feature is that blue line on top since it gets shot up at the end? Yeah, the, the blue line at the top represents the feature with the biggest weight or in other words, that feature seems to be most predictive of the thing we're trying to predict. If I could, yeah, and as we can see as we go to the right, if I could only use one feature, in fact, to predict the thing I wanted to predict. So not only does it start off as the biggest weight, but it also hangs on the line. <coughs> Connor? So sorry, what's the benefit again of like having these features reach zero rather than just approach zero? What's the benefit of having these features reach zero instead of just approach zero? So if you're just trying to make predictions, it might not matter that much because if I have some weights that are very tiny, they're not going to influence the predictions that much. But making better predictions isn't the only reason why we might want to do feature selection. So for example, if, if we want to interpret, like if someone says, give me a list of the factors that matter, right? Or um, I want to throw some things away when I collect more data or throw some things away in terms of computation. Um, here it doesn't, also when you're making predictions you can ignore those features. So here predictions are fast anyways and we don't really care but there are situations in which this kind of sparsity, so by the way the word sparsity if you haven't heard it before just means a thing with a bunch of zeros, a vector or a matrix with a bunch of zeros. So this kind of sparsity um, in some cases is very significant in terms of speed up as well because you can ignore a bunch of stuff. I guess no, we must have talked about sparsity. Yeah, we talked about sparse matrix representations for at least naive Bayes, I think. Uh, Oliver. Uh, so would it be a valid procedure to say, um, let's say I want three features to for my model to start with a large lambda and then get smaller, smaller, and smaller until we get the desired number? Yeah, so Oliver's question is if we want some number of features, can we just keep increasing lambda until we get that number of features? Sure. Um, why not? <laughs> okay, so let's compare um, L1 and L2 regularization. So they both do the dealing with overfitting thing. Um, L2 preserves our ability to use the normal equations for linear regression. Remember, this also goes beyond linear regression. But um, with L1, we have to be more careful about the optimization. Not only can we not use the normalizations, but there's also this non-smoothness to worry about. Um, 
And we also don't get the unique solution. Um, although if we combine the two, then we can get back the unique solution. So, right. Here is something that went wrong last year. A lot of people confused L1 loss with L1 regularization. Even though I'm saying it now, I'm still worried it's going to happen. Um, the L1 loss, the absolute value loss, that was on the term on the left, the term involving the data. We did that because we, it, it was robust to outliers. L1 regularization is not on the term involving the data, it's on the term involving the penalty. And that has, it's not about outliers, it's about, it's about overfitting and feature selection. <coughs> and you could do both, but don't mix them up. It's very important. Okay. Here's maybe what, maybe what I think is the most fun point of the day. When we had the non-smoothness issue for the L1 loss, we said, okay, let's smooth the thing out. We can use the Huber loss or some other loss that is smooths out the version. So a question that you could ask is why don't we just do the same thing here? I mean, I just mentioned the non-smoothness was going to be a challenge in terms of the optimization. So why don't we just smooth it out and that will make optimization easier. Understanding why that doesn't work is requires a pretty deep understanding of what's going on here. So let me try to pitch it to you. <coughs> When we had the outlier problem, we were using the squared error, and the squared error was a parabola, and it got really big, far away from zero. Meaning big residuals, big errors, were an extra big deal. And that's what made it not robust. And what the thing was doing near zero, that wasn't important to us. That wasn't what was causing problems for us with the parabola in the squared error. It was the So we just did this. Here. It is not the out there that is the problem. It is exactly the part near zero that we care about. So in fact, the non-smoothness, and I used it in the argument five minutes ago, the non-smoothness is precisely what is giving us the sparsity. It's the fact that my incentive to make it towards zero is still big, 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 and then you come at it from both sides and you get this non-smooth point, but you're not gradually running out of slope or incentive or whatever you want to call it to push the thing to zero. So if we use Huber regularization, we would just be undoing the whole point of doing this, which was exactly the sharp point. Christian. And when we, got, when we use the L1 regularization, got like a vector of weights with like 10 values and six of them are nearly zero. Is it a problem if we just ignore them? Okay, you asked if we use L1 regularization and you have a bunch of the weights that are nearly zero. So the whole point of L1 regularization is that they will be exactly zero, not nearly zero. With L2 regularization, they may, you may have a bunch that are nearly zero, but here, they will, you don't have to ignore them, they will ignore themselves. They will become zero and having something equal to zero is ignoring it because it will be zero times my feature. So that's the whole idea behind L1 regularization. Okay, and I'm out of time so I got to go to the summary. Okay, we talked about standardizing features. We talked about standardizing features and standardizing targets, right, as two different things. We talked about hyperparameter optimization, which is this important but messy thing. Then we talked about <coughs> L1 regularization, which does both regularization and feature selection. Um, and the most important thing about it is it's not the same as the L1 loss. So um, please try not to mix them up. Okay, see you at the midterm. Oh,